So welcome everyone um, and thank you for joining our first ever uh, DOE Office of Indian Energy virtual uh, review. Uh, we've been doing these reviews since I think 2002, or I have anyway. Um, but this is the first time we've done a virtual, so so it's it's working sort of. Next slide, please. So by way of introduction, I may not have met everybody that's on the phone. My name is Lizana Pierce. I've been doing energy development for a long time. I feel really old some days, um, actually. But I've had the the, the pleasure and, and the honor and the privilege really of working with Indian tribes in many Alaska native villages uh, with their energy development over the last 20 years. Um, I'm a mechanical engineer by degree. Um, in my current position, I'm the deployment supervisor. Um, so I execute the deployment program, which is comprised of financial assistance, competitive grants, technical assistance, and no charge to tribes and tribal entities, and education and outreach also support the uh, communication and, and our technical providers uh, overseeing that. Um, James is second to the left on the bottom picture here. Um, he will be helping us moderate the questions and breaking in on the presenters and telling them they have a five minute warning and, and that kind of thing so we can stay on track. Could you go to slide four, Monica, please? So um, next, I'd like to introduce uh, Tweety Doe. She's another member of our team. She's duty stationed in Colorado with myself. Um, she, as a project officer, uh, she has you know many projects you'll hear about this week. She acts as a project officer for those um, those projects. She, uh, before joining the Office of Indian Energy, she worked with DOE's Office of Energy Efficiency Renewable Energy. Um, specifically came on board during the Recovery Act for the Energy Efficiency Conservation Block Grant. Um, prior to joining DOE, she worked with the Council of Energy Resource, uh, Resource Tribes, which is where I met her originally. Uh, DOE, uh, uh, Ms. Doe, DOE, sorry. <laughs> she has a Bachelor of Arts degree in Political Science at the University of Washington and a Master's of Arts International Studies with emphasis on economics and human rights from the University of Denver. She obtained her project management professional PMP certification in 2013, and she's also a certified project officer as well as a contracting officer representative. Um, and Tweety has been helping moderate some of these sessions. And I'm gonna go on quickly. Um, for those who are not familiar with our office, I wanted to just give you some um, brief information and I'm going quickly because <laughs> so we could stay on time. Uh, so the Office of Indian, Indian Energy currently has nine federal employees, and I want you to know that's actually more than twice as many as we had last November, uh, with four in D.C., three in Colorado, and two in Alaska currently. Uh, we also have contractor support at headquarters and at Colorado to, to help us implement the National Financial, uh, Financial Assistance Program across the nation. Uh, we have... Uh, some support through the Golden Field Office for procurement, legal, and uh, NEPA support. Next slide, please. So pictured here, this was taken at uh, last uh, November's program review. I'm um, just going through the names. Um, we have in the back row, James Jensen. Uh, next to him is Chris Cinema, both contractors supporting the deployment program in, from Colorado. Next is uh, Gibby Kokonowski, our federal staff member, uh, duty station in Alaska. And next to Gibby is Director uh, Kevin R. Frost, who's located in Washington, D.C. In the front row, we have uh, Jamie Alley on the far left, myself. Uh, next is Jen Luna. She's team lead for the contractor staff in Colorado. Next to Jen is Tweety Doe. Um, as I said, DOE project officer. She's uh, here with me in Colorado. And next is uh, Susan Manley. Again, contractor support in Colorado. Next is uh, Jasmine Anderson. She supports uh, Director Frost in DC, and on the far right is Tommy Jones. Um, so again, as, as the team uh, pictured here, could you go back please? Um, was taken last November in Lakewood. It does not include those who've joined us since, and I just wanna give you, um, introduce the rest of the team very quickly. Uh, since last November, KV Kuchnowski was taken um, has taken a senior policy advisor position. He remains duty stationed in Anchorage, Alaska. 
uh, he's been joined by Alan Verbitsky, not shown in the picture. Alan is an engineer with a wealth of knowledge um, in many a large portfolio of energy and energy systems. He also has experience working with Alaska Native Villages, and since joining the office, he basically returned home to Alaska. Uh, Brant Petrasic, not shown, is previously with DOE's Office of Environmental Management. Um, he has a history working with tribes and has joined us as a senior advisor duty station in Washington, D.C. Um, Director Frost, who, she, who is shown in the back row, second to the right, he is joined um, in D.C. by Quintella Wilson. She's now our budget officer, and Paula Toole, our new management analyst. And a very recent addition to our office, sort of, <laughs> is uh, Dr. Tommy Jones, uh, shown on the far right of the picture. Dr. Jones started as an intern with the office while he was finishing his Ph.D. He later joined us as a contractor. And he has not even nearly, not a month ago, a few weeks, joined us uh, as a federal staff member. Um, so we're keeping him. On the contractor side, not shown is Jessica Becker, who joined uh, the deployment team, the contractor team in Colorado. She's a project monitor uh, supporting sort of the national assist, uh, financial assistance grants and agreements. Next slide, please. Before we jump to the project presentation, I wanted to go over some event details. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be made available on DOE's Office of Indian Energy Policy and Programs website in a couple of weeks. Copies of the presentation slides will be posted on the Office of Indian Energy's website shortly, as soon as possible, as soon as we can. Um, and everyone will receive a post-event email with the link to the page where the slides and the recordings will be located. Because we are recording this webinar, all slides have, or all phones have been muted. We will answer your written questions at the end of the final presentation of this session. Um, you can submit those questions at any time by clicking on the question button located in the webinar control box on your screen and typing in your questions. For the presenters, please ensure that you are muted when not presented. Be aware that because we're we're on this uh, timeline, we don't have the flexibility like we would normally have. We will break in and provide you a five-minute uh, reminder, 15 minutes into your presentation. So please plan your time accordingly. And with that, I'm going to go to the next slide, please. I just want to remind everybody that you know we started the program review many years ago. Primarily, I think you know was bringing people together at the time, you know, um, small pockets of, of different tribes were looking at energy, it didn't seem like, you know, they were talking to each other. So it was a wonderful opportunity to provide a network um, also to, to sort of share success, celebrate and share successes and lessons learned. Um, it has, it is a requirement of accepting an award from the Office of Indian Energy and as part of an annual progress project progress update um, that's required for your grant agreement. So let's uh, jump to, I don't know, slide, I think 14 or 15. There you go. Uh, so we're going to start uh, session six. Um, and we're going to hear from, I think, Sunny, I, Terrell, and Brian Hirsch um, about NANA's regional uh, corporation, their community scale solar energy uh, deployment in Northwest Alaska, and that's in Upland, Deering, and Kotzebue. Um, next, we're going to hear from Dan Smith uh, about Togiak Natives Limited uh, Heat Recovery Project. And um, last of the day, but, but not least, of course, is Alexana Salmon and Carl Hill, who will give us uh, an update on Igiagi's Village Council's uh, microgrid project and marine renewable energy for the village. Of Igiagig. And so with that, uh, Monica, would you bring up uh, the first slide deck? And I'm going to turn this over to uh, Sunny, Terrell, and Brian. It's all yours. Thank you, Lizana. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I'll go ahead and get started and I'll, we'll try to keep our, our presentation within 15 minutes. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, uh, first of all, thank you for having us. Uh, my name is Sonny Adams. I'm the Director of Alternative Energy for NANA Regional Corporation. I've been working for NANA for about 13 years. Uh, prior to this, I worked as a metallurgist up at the uh, Red Dog Mine. 
I'll be presenting with uh, Dr. Brian Hirsch, who's been assisting all of our uh, uh, regional energy projects, and Terrell Jones, the energy coordinator for NANA. Uh, today, we're gonna give an update on our, our uh, community solar projects. Um, looking at this first slide, uh, this is our, our boundaries, our region. Uh, it's about 38,000 square miles. We have 11 communities. Uh, NANA Regional Corporation is headquartered right there in Kotzebue, and 50% of our shareholders uh, live in the region. It's about 61% uh, more expensive to live in our region than it is to live here in Anchorage. Uh, our region is a roadless system, meaning that you can only get around by a snow machine, plane, or a boat. Uh, next slide, please. So although this, this slide says Nana Energy Vision, uh, we have partnered up with the Northwest Arctic Borough, our tribes, the city, and all of the regional entities through our energy steering committee that was formed under one of the DOE grants. And this energy vision is not only Nana's, it's, it's all of our partners as well. And it's to be 50% reliant on alternative energy sources, both renewable and non-renewable. And Ingemar and I are in agreement that we are on track to meet this goal. You know, we wanna see a 10% decrease of imported diesel fuels by 2020. And I think, you know, we're, we're getting there, especially because of this, this partnership that we have with the tribes, with DOE, with the city, with the state, and all of our consultants and the ener energy industry. Next slide, please. So why are we doing this? You know, I, we've shown this slide at least half a dozen times over the years, and it's it's because we have a high cost of energy. Our gasoline prices, our home heating fuel prices continue to remain high. If you look at this chart, anything in red is an increase in fuel prices. Anything in black, that's where the fuel prices stayed the same. And anything uh, in green was a reduce in, in fuel prices. Also on this chart is the electrical rates. Uh, the, the left column, the one through 500 kilowatt hour PCE rate is the lower rate. If you go over 500 kilowatt hours, it, it transitions over to the column on the right, which is the, the rate without the PCE. Our, our concern is, is that because of the COVID pandemic, the oil prices have dropped and uh, power cost equalization, the state subsidy is no longer secure. So it's it's equally important that we that we bring on renewables to help lower the cost of energy for our region. Next slide, please. So there's two grants that we're going to talk about today. One of them is the DOE Community Solar Scale uh, Grant along with the USDA Battery Grant. I'm going to give the basic information about the grant and I'm going to ask Dr. Hirsch to to chime in and give some of the, the technical information. So Department of Energy was awarded $1 million to install community solar arrays in Deering, Buckland, and Kotzebue. It required a $1 million cost share. Uh, 200,000 each came from Deering and Buckland. They used the Village Economic Development Committee funds and Kotzebue used a six, um, came up with a $610,000 cost share that came from the Northwest Arctic Borough. Uh, KEA financed the $610,000 cost share for the project from the Village Improvement Funds, and they also used funds of their own, their own to, um, to complete the project. NANA and KEA formed a joint venture to share ownership of the solar equipment during the grant period. In order to, to make the project happen, a joint venture agreement was signed. Uh, both Deary and Buckland, like I said earlier, use their Village Economic Deve Development Committee funds uh, for their cost share. And, you know, it, this this project, you know, it wasn't done by just NANA alone. We collaborated with, with the city, the tribes, the borough, um, and, and a lot of the leadership uh, came in to help support the project along with uh, DOE. Next slide, please. So here's some pictures of our Buckland project. Uh, we, uh, one thing that NANA really pushes for is local hire. So we worked with the city of Buckland 
to get this project. And we also had some consultants come in and help like Dr. Hirsch and a, a few contractors. This solar array is operational, but still needs performance monitoring and communication integration. Um, that really got pushed back because of the COVID situation. Uh, this particular solar array was completed in December of 2019, and it's the first box power installation in Alaska. Uh, it has modified foundation and racking. Uh, it's, each project is, is based on site specific needs. Uh, this project here is, is rated for 145 mile an hour winds and has a 45 degree angle. Uh, one of the things that we really emphasized was local hire and community training and major in-kind contributions like the gravel and, and the land that it was put on. Next slide, please. Hey, Sonny, if I could jump in for a moment. This is uh, Brian Hirsch. And um, if you could go back, sorry about that. Who's ever controlling the slides there? Yeah, thank you. So um, some of the things maybe just to notice here, um, historically, uh, wind turbines are often like put on um, rooftops or uh, what we call ground mount. What we did here was use what is very common across rural Alaska shipping containers and this company Box Power, that's really their thing as they put uh, solar panels on shipping containers. And one of the reasons that was very appealing to us is because Buckland is in an area of permafrost. And so we figured the less that we really had to mess with the ground, the better off we would be. We didn't have to drill piles through the ground, et cetera. What we ended up doing actually was stacking two uh, shipping containers on top of each other. So you can just barely see a little bit of the blue that's right above the ground um, that looks kind of like the foundation. That's actually another shipping container uh, completely buried. And um, that container was filled with uh, gravel and actually some scrap metal and other things that the village wanted to get rid of. And um, we, uh, we stacked the shipping containers on top of each other, and that was our foundation. And so we didn't have to pour concrete. We didn't have to do anything else. We just used um, uh, items that were lying around the village. And that was located right next to the power plant. So there was a very good, easy connection between the solar panels and controls and connections into the diesel powerhouse. So next. So here's some pictures of our, our Deering solar array. Uh, uh, this design was a little bit different. We used super sacks, gravel and duckbill foundation for the anchoring. That also reduced costs because we didn't have to dig. Uh, one thing that we should mention about Deering, they're very sensitive about uh, digging uh, in their village because of historical artifacts. So we thought we felt this was the best way to to minimize having to dig on, on their lands. Uh, we used a single 50 kW inverter, which helped reduce costs. Like I said earlier, we maximized uh, local hire uh, via Ipnachak Electric, the tribe in the city. Uh, we also used radio communication back to the power plant for full system control, including uh, curtailment. Is there anything else you wanna say about this project, Brian? Yeah, thank you, Sonny. Um, the main lesson that i would share here is that between the buckland and deering projects it was one year later and it was the very first project and then the second project and from lessons learned we probably reduced costs between 15 and 20 percent uh, because of some of the things that sunny mentioned the super sacks gravel and duckbill foundation in particular allowed us to uh not bury a connex um save on gravel costs and fill inside the shipping containers. I'm um, using the single inverter instead of three individual ones, one on each uh, shipping container and then connecting them together like we did in Buckland on the first one. All of that was very substantial. We'd also paid additional engineering to get that tilt angle, the 45 degrees in Buckland for the first time, because typically they're at 30 degrees. And um, then we're able to use that design again in Deering. So now moving forward, um, there's probably a few other things that we can continue to reduce costs on, but the point is, as you can replicate these, uh, there's really some, uh, you know, cost curve and lessons learned that I think we'll continue to improve on. Thank you, Brian. Next slide, please. Uh, here's some design specs. Um, uh, 
innovations and lessons learned. The tilt angle was 45 degrees, as Brian mentioned. Each box is about 15 kilowatts. Uh, if you have low wind locations, like if you're in the in interior Alaska, it's less costly. Uh, we maximized local hire. Uh, the trade-off between size of array and construction requirements, each situation is unique, requires analysis. And, and that's pretty much across all of our villages. We need to go in and take a second look as to where we're going to put the, uh, um, the solar arrays along with altering the design. Uh, these solar community solar arrays were integrated with batteries, wind, grid forming inverters, electric boilers and powerhouse and water plant water plant there was a lot of extra work and we're still having to work through some of these issues uh, we did do some training in Kotzebue at the Alaska Technical Center we had SEI come in in the region in 2018 and we had some of uh, our village participants along with the regional entities participate um, one of the goals is to continue to replicate these projects in Kobuk and Shungnak and Noatak next slide please uh, so this is phase three of the uh, community solar grant that we received. Um, uh, this project uh, is located in our hub community of Kotzebue. Uh, Kotzebue Electric Association was our partner. They turned around and hired Alaska Native Renewable Industries. They were selected as KEA's solar contractor. Uh, what KEA did is they replaced their legacy wind turbines that are no longer operational and use some of their existing infrastructure to reduce cost. It's the largest solar array in rural Alaska. Initially, we were shooting for three to 400 uh, KW community solar array. KEA uh, took it upon themselves to increase the size of that solar array up to 576 kilowatts. It's interconnected with existing wind, batteries, electric boilers, and now electric vehicle charging, which is now happening above the Arctic Circle. Uh, drilling through permafrost for ground mounting, it improved over time, but could definitely be improved for future cost savings. One of the things I'll say about this, this part of the project that these guys were working um, in 30 below weather during a pandemic. Uh, so they had some tough challenges um, when it came to putting in the, uh, drilling the holes for, or putting in the micro piles, uh, they had issues. They had to go back and pre-drill the holes. Um, but in, even in the cold weather, cold weather, they were able to, to get through and get it done. Next slide, please. So I, I think that, you know, we're, we're extremely grateful uh, for the grant that we got from DOE. I think one of our priorities as a region now is to replicate these projects in the other villages. So like I mentioned earlier, we're gonna be uh, working with the borough on installing community solar arrays for Kobuk and Shungnak. Uh, those two villages are interconnected via a 10 mile distribution line. And now we're in the process of receiving $1.3 million from USDA to install a 150 KW solar array with a 650 KWH battery for Shungnak and Kobuk. Uh, we intend to create an IPP and sell power to AVEC. Uh, this is a, a collaborative effort, a partnership between tribes and cities of Shungnak, Kobuk, Nan, and the Northwest Arctic Borough. Next slide, please. I would just actually draw your attention to that picture. Sorry, if you if you look back at there, that is the Kotzebue Solar Array. And um, they've had these 50 kilowatt wind turbines that uh, are now over 20 years old. And they had infrastructure that had inverters for the wind turbines and other things that were keeping them out of the uh, temperature, out of the weather. And so they were able to use the same um, boxes for new solar inverters, which were much cheaper. And they had information on the uh, geotech because it already poured wind, uh, wind turbine foundations. So they knew about the drilling, even though it was challenging. And they had communication cables going all the way back to the powerhouse, which is something like two or three miles away from there. So um, there's a lot of, again, cost savings that we could do. And it's you know really a, a classic example there of wind and solar um, being put together. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Next slide, please. We think it's equally important to talk about the batteries and controls because this really helps, it makes it work in, in our villages. So we're gonna spend a few minutes going over the USDA high energy cost grant. 
Uh, Nana was so- Sorry for the interruption. You have five minutes remaining. Thank you. Okay, we'll move quickly. Uh, Nana received $1.6 million to install energy storage batteries and controls in Deering and Buckland. It was necessary to make the solar effective. Uh, we partnered up with ABB, we purchased our control system and we used staff batteries for the operation in Buckland and Deering. Our partners were IES, ABB, SAF, KEA, Deerstone, Northwest Arctic Borough uh, that helped out with the system integration. It allows for high penetration renewables to turn diesels off when everything, when there's enough renewable energy available. It also controls the electric boiler for additional diesel displacement. Next slide, please. So this is one of our important slides. Uh, you know, we're breaking trail. It was the first and second utility scale wind solar battery diesel hybrid system in rural Alaska. We hit diesel off operation in Buckland on July 24 and endearing on October 11, 2019. Uh, we expect significant fuel savings. We're still collecting performance data. Uh, we're developing institutional and financial structures to monetize the fuel savings. We still need to address heating the diesel engines and powerhouse under long duration diesel off operation. Uh, it also helps us enables high penetration, high quality renewable generation like wind and solar energy without destabilizing the system. Next slide, please. Um, I would just say real quickly there that uh, in Deering, we have determined that we're at about 40% um, uh, annual fuel savings. And because of the batteries, the solar energy is actually outperforming our original expectations by about 10% and we are running about 20% on an annual basis with the diesels completely turned off. And at this stage, frankly, if we had more wind and or solar, um, we would be doing that even more so. And it's really just a, a matter of money at this point. But the batteries were really essential to get all of that solar and wind uh, into the system and, and properly captured. So it's been very important to, you know, solar and wind really allows us to convert to renewable energy, but then the uh, batteries allow us to capture it and store it over time, because sometimes we'll be producing more than you need at any one moment in time. That's what I got, thank you. Thanks, Brian, next slide, please. So in closing, you know, what are, you know, I, the biggest value for us is we learned how to install community solars for our region, and we want to replicate these projects. Uh, we can't say enough how grateful we are Right now, our shareholders are saying, hey, when, when are we gonna do the next village? When are we going? And so we've got partnerships, we've got relationships into where we can make this happen. And so we're, we're putting a, a solar array and batteries into, into Kobuk and Shungnak. Uh, we're forming a joint action agency within our region to identify what services we can regionalize, but how can we fast track and replicate these solar projects within our different villages? Um, we intend to uh, submit a DOE grant application for solar and battery for, for NORTAC. We had a meeting on that this morning, trying to figure out how we can come up with the cost share and how we can move that project forward. Uh, so far, we've received support from all of our villages in the region, and I think leadership is on board to keep us going. Uh, on behalf of NANA Regional Corporation, I just want to say thank you very much. Next slide. Thank you. Thank you, Sonny. Thank you, Brian. Um, it's so cool. <laughs> you know, they, they'll say that it takes the village, but I think in Alaska, it takes more than the village. It takes the regional court, the village, the borough, the state, the federal, and, and everyone. But it's amazing what's, what's been done there. Um, next, I'm going to invite uh, Dan Smith. And if we could uh, pull up his slides. And Dan, if you're ready, please proceed. Yeah, hi, thank you, Lizana. Um, and you know, to uh, real quick touch on your closing remark, it takes more than a village to get these projects going. Um, I just wanna point out the last presentation was about solar installations. Now we're gonna talk about heat recovery, um, which is drawing excess heat away from the generator. Um, and in order to do that, the generator has to be running. Um, and hopefully with the solar panels, uh, we'll eventually get away from having the diesel generators at all, uh, go completely diesels off. Um, but in the meantime, you know, there's still waste heat available. Um, and so I wanna use this uh, opportunity to talk about heat recovery as laying the groundwork for district heating on a community scale. 
Um, so with that being said, um, let's go ahead and get started talking about the Togiak Heat Recovery Project. Uh, if you could go to the next slide, please. Um, so I do have a couple boilerplate uh, slides here. Uh, first off is a little history. Uh, Togiak Natives Limited uh, was founded in 1973 as part of the ANCSA um, uh, Act. Uh, I know that's redundant, but uh, it serves approximately 959 shareholders. Um, the majority of them live in the community of Togiak. And the total population of the community uh, is right around 800. I think it's actually gone up a little bit in the last year since I pulled these figures. Um, next slide, please. Um, and so Togiak Natives Limited partnered with Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium uh, to build this heat recovery system uh, for uh, to serve their heating needs at the water treatment facility. Um, and so uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar, um, Alaska Native Tribal Con Health Consortium uh, serves the uh, public health and sanitation needs of all the Alaska Native tribes uh, throughout the whole state. Um, and so the, the question, uh, actually we could go to the next slide please. Um, and this is so, this is a kind of overview of what uh, the environmental health and engineering portion of ANTHC does. Uh, you know, we work on the health facilities and clinics, sanitation systems, water, sewer, you know, everything, all the infrastructure that is needed to make uh, a community healthy. Uh, next slide, please. And within that, uh, the rural energy uh, team um, is working uh, to lower the cost of providing these public health services, which uh, these days is highlighted by the ongoing pandemic. Um, the importance of public health systems is highlighted. Um, and so what is a health corporation doing with um, heat recovery? Uh, next slide, please. So this is generally what it looks like uh, the, the cost sheet for providing, for the costs associated with providing uh, water, sewer, and um, other public health needs. Um, and the labor cost is the largest one. Um, parts and regulatory, those are pretty much fixed costs. The one cost you can change is the energy costs. Um, and that we're that's our mission at the energy team. Um, we're trying to bring that cost down to make uh, public health infrastructure more affordable for, for these communities. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so the first thing you should do uh, is pursue energy efficiency. Um, and as I'll, I'll show on the next couple slides here, a uh, picture of the water treatment plant, which was relatively recently constructed. So we've we've pretty much addressed all you can do in terms of energy efficiency in the water treatment plant. Um, the next step would be um, figuring out how to efficiently use all the energy going into a community. And that includes uh, the imported diesel uh, that's being burned in the power plant. Um, next slide, please. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with uh, heat recovery projects in Alaska, um, typically what we would do uh, is tap into the power plant. In this case, it's AVEC. Um, and we draw the excess heat from their generators and pipe it over to the water utility building, or in some cases, a washeteria. Uh, and for this particular project, we're also heating a library, a shop, and the city office building. Um, and there is plans to expand that uh, that district heating over to a clinic and um, a police station. Um, now I'll have a map, I can point that out later in this presentation. Uh, next slide, please.
This is a little bit more detailed. Um, you can see the above ground utilidor. Not all communities have utilidors uh, in places where there's permafrost um, and you don't really want to disturb the ground as the previous presenter mentioned. Um, what you would do is you run pipes above ground in insulated utilidors. Um, and this, um, this diagram kind of shows where all the heat loads are. You have the water treatment and pump house, that's a heating load. Um, in some places we have vacuum sewage plants. So if you picture um, the bathrooms on an airplane you know, where it's, uh, it's a vacuum system to, to pull the uh, sewage out of the houses. Um, and those are used in, in places where there's not a lot of elevation. Um, but uh, what this diagram is trying to show is that there is a heating uh, need at all these locations. Um, and if we can find a way to capture the heat that would otherwise be wasted at the power plant, um, it lowers the reliance on imported fossil fuels. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and so this project has been a long time in the works. Uh, it got started back in 2015 uh, with a feasibility study and some preliminary work done uh, in partnership with the city of Togiak and Alaska, and, uh, Alaska Energy Authority. Um, the idea uh, back in 2015 and up to 2017 was that um, the Alaska Energy Authority would be able to fully fund design and construction. Um, however, as the design process proceeded, uh, it became apparent that there was not going to be enough funding available through the Alaska Energy Authority. Um, so ANTHC uh, partnering with Togiak Natives, I am sorry, partnering with Togiak Natives Limited um, and the city of Togiak uh, pursued additional funding through the Department of Energy, Office of Indian Energy, uh, which is why I'm here talking today, uh, as well as the Alaska State Department of Environmental Conservation. Um, and so through those three funding sources, we have a fully funded project um, and we are wrapping up construction pretty soon. Um, next slide, please. Okay, we've made it through the boilerplate slides. Uh, now we're going to get into the more interesting slides. Um, and I was mistaken, the project uh, was originally conceptualized back in 2010. So definitely a long time coming. Um, and this picture here, uh, that uh, light blue building that you see with the two pipes sticking out of it, that is the water treatment plant. Uh, so in contrast with, I believe that is their old water storage tank in the background there. Um, it is a much newer building. It's very energy efficient. Um, and those two pipes, that is the, as of two months ago, completed uh, heat exchange, uh, heat recovery loop, um, both the supply and return there. Um, so we did complete the design in 2019. Uh, we finished securing the funding sources during the last half of 2019. Um, and then next slide, please. And then we were all ready to go. Um, we had everything lined up to begin mobilizing in March. Um, and then uh, the pandemic hit. Uh, so we had to uh, uh, rework a few things. Um, and the good news is we were able to deploy with minimal delays. We were first on site on September 8th, uh, just a few months ago. And, you know, so here we've got a couple pictures of our guys putting the uh, pipes in the ground. You can see the, you know, the, the pipes that are staged there. The pipe is pretty small and then most of it is insulation uh, to make sure the heat gets to where it needs to go instead of bleeding into the ground. Um, and actually in the top right photo and bottom left, you can see there is some rigid foam board insulation. Uh, to add that extra layer of insulation. Um, then on the bottom right is on the interior. Uh, that's that's in the library there. Um, you, you can see our guy uh, putting in the heat lines um, going to the unit heaters. 
Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, as of right now, there are four end users. Um, we're pulling our heat from the power plant, which was newly constructed in 2018. Uh, it's directing the heat first and foremost up to the water treatment plant. That's the biggest heating load here. Um, and then it sends whatever heat's left over to the city office and then on to the city shop and library. Uh, the city shop and library are situated in the community's old school building, which has been repurposed. Um, right now, the city of Togiak is pursuing plans to expand this heating loop, uh, this district heating system, over to the VPSO building, kind of in the center of the map. Uh, that's Village Public Safety Officer. Um, and then on to the clinic. Um, and this just kind of shows. You know, district heating can go a long way. Uh, there's plenty of excess power uh, in this coming from this power plant. Um, and, you know, it's laying the groundwork for uh, a unified heating system uh, that can be tapped into. Um, uh, next slide, please. Uh, so the original cost estimate we got uh, when, once we finished the design uh, was to be about 1.2 million. Um, the Department of Energy is uh, being able to cover about half of that cost, um, and we're very grateful for that. Um, the other half is coming primarily from that Alaska Energy Authority grant that initiated this whole project, um, and then the state of Alaska through the Department of Environmental Conservation um, is also able to is providing a subsidized loan, a partially subsidized loan uh, to cover the costs of heating the water treatment plant. Um, now that was all before the um, adjustments we had to make to accommodate the uh, COVID pandemic. Um, with the adjustments uh, we had to the original plan was to um, demobilize or wrap up the work this autumn and be demobilized by the end of November. Uh, that didn't really work out for us. Um, so we still have some equipment on site and we're planning on demobilizing on the first barge in spring. Um, we also had to do a couple last minute changes to the piping in the ABEC plant. And, uh, you know, that that added up to about $150,000 in changes. Um, and as of right now, the heating cost of fuel is $5.63 in per gallon. Um, Sorry. Next slide, please. Sorry for the interruption. You have five minutes remaining. All right, thank you. Yeah, we, we're almost done here, so we should be able to get through that. Um, yeah, so the, the benefits of building this um, is uh, water rate stabilization. Uh, over the last about 14 years, uh, the price that um, residents of Togiak have to pay uh, for clean drinking water went up from $100 per month to $120 per month. And the hope is that um, with the lower heating costs uh, from the heat recovery system, it will bring down the expense of providing clean drinking water uh, to the to all the residents of Togiak as um, and then another a bonus is it will reduce carbon emissions uh, so rather than having emissions at the power plant and then emissions at the oil boilers which would normally be heating the water treatment plant you now have uh, one point of emissions just at the power plant and you're capturing um, more of the energy out of that gallon of diesel that you're burning in the generator. Um, and we're, we're anticipating over the, the uh, life of this project, it'll offset 400, over 400,000 gallons. Um, 
and that would equivalent equate to about 306,000 tons of carbon dioxide offset every year. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so a little bit more um, on the numbers here. Uh, as I said, water rate stabilization. Uh, there are emergency services. Uh, the uh, city shop is also the community fire hall, I believe. And uh, the emergency services, yeah, what it costs to heat that building is, is also been increasing over the years. Uh, so bringing this down will, will make the community, if um, their operating costs, they can spread it out further because uh, they won't have as much expense on heating. Um, the offset uh, with the notion, you know, if oil prices stay as high as they are, I think I said it was uh, $5.63 per gallon in Togiak. Um, uh, we're anticipating it'll save the community over $2.3 million over the entire project's life. Um, well, that, that's the offset. Um, and then with the heat sales agreement, you know, so they're still going to be purchasing heat uh, from AVEC uh, even after, after that heat sales agreement is factored in. Uh, will still be a $1.6 million savings over the life of the project. Um, next slide, please. And uh, this is a table pulled directly from the uh, feasibility study. And it just illustrates that, you know, the estimated fuel usage and estimated heat delivered um, there is plenty of heat available coming from that power plant, um, and that, and uh, as the community expands, uh, they'll be able to capture more and more of that heat that's right now being wasted from the power plant. Um, and so, uh, to go back to what I was alluding to earlier um, from Sunny's presentation about the solar uh, installations, um, as these communities throughout the state um, step towards renewable energy and alternative energy and is less reliant on imported diesel to fuel their power plants. Uh, the hope is that uh, these district heating systems might be able to transition to using additional heating sources, um, at least for the larger community loads or the larger public, larger public buildings. Um, we have a number of outside of Togiak that are all already looking at wind to heat systems um, where an electric boiler would be plugged into a district heating system um, and the electric boiler would take any excess wind energy that's not being used and convert it into heat um, and I don't really want to stray too much from the original topic uh, so with that we go to the next slide um, I will just conclude that ANTHC is always looking for ways to increase the affordability and efficiency of public health infrastructure in rural Alaska. Um, and with that, uh, thank you. Um, if you want to go to my, yeah, thank you. Uh, and that's all I had. Thank you again. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dan. Um, wonderful. It's good to see hardware in the ground. I love it. Okay, next uh, we're going to transition to um, and invite Alexana and Carl to give us an overview of the Igiagig micro microgrid project. You're on. Guyana Lizana, can you guys hear me? Lizana? Yes, yes, perfect. Okay, great. Uh, we're presenting from two different locations. So I'm in Igiagi, where I was born and raised, and I'm currently the president of the village council and have been overseeing a lot of different uh, alternative energy work since about 2008. And then Carl will pick up halfway through the presentation um, and give you more on his background. Um, specifically under this Indian Energy Grant, uh, we'll be talking about our microgrid and RivGen 2. Um, but before I begin, I wanted to um, just mention that Igiagig is located in southwest Alaska, and all the presentations so far have been so fascinating, um, coming from a regional 
Native Corporation across Alaska and what they're doing, and then the perspective of a statewide consortium and what they're doing at Togiak. And then for us, we're just this little tribe of 70 people that uh, have been working to implement renewable for our federally recognized tribe and tribally owned utility. So similar to the NANA presentation, the why is self-explanatory. Our people have lived here for nine 9,000 years sustainably. And it's not until the last 100 years that um, we're seeing the fuel prices rising, the growing dependence on government assistance. And similarly, when we received the first Department of Energy strategic planning funding in 2008, we really projected that by 2025, we, we should go diesels off with what we were working towards. So we can go to the next slide. It's the same writing on the wall too, as far as looking at the quarter of a million dollars it costs every year to run our, our electric company. And that fuel is usually around 60% of that. And we're not unique. We're one of 250 microgrid communities in Alaska. And I like this picture because it really displays how uh, we have the RivGen being assembled on the beach while the fuel plane is flying over and landing. Our runway is only 3,000 feet, so we can only get a certain sized aircraft in, which which holds us hostage to that rate of, of fuel. Before we flew it in, we were barging it in, but with uh, climate changes and geographic challenges getting to the community, that we, it left us very vulnerable too, because we couldn't tell if we would get our annual winter fuel supply until it was a little too late. So for a long time, since 1998, our village was planning on how we can move towards incorporating alternative energy. Next slide. Sorry, next slide, please. I like to, you know, keep my sentences going as they transition to the next slide. I don't know, it's probably confusing. If, there we go. So the how we came, about this knowing we had limited resources as a tribe and that we'd need a partner and that our original funding came from our, our Quidduck River, which flows from Lake Iliamna's largest, or Alaska's largest lake, which is Lake Iliamna, that our upper, the upper Quidduck doesn't typically freeze in the winter time, that we had this crystal clear, relatively debris-free river that, um, it was identified that we had hydrokinetic potential by 2008. So it required power plant upgrades. It required uh, funding initially from the State of Alaska Renewable Energy Fund. And with our, every time we came to a milestone of receiving funding, we would have to look at, well, what's feasible with this? And part of it is our river supports one of the last largest runs of sockeye salmon in the world. So we have, 100% of the run that makes it to the lakes region and then 100% of the out migration of smolt. So we have two significant salmon events per year. And if we felt like if it could be done here in Igiagig, then it should be doable elsewhere. But that because of the permitting headache, uh, we the best thing we could do with our initial funding was bathymetric profiling of the upper Quijack and receive all the permits and then open up a test site. And that's the approach we took where hydrokinetic companies competed amongst themselves for funding and then deploying in a geogig. And after we we had experience with all of that, then we decided to work with Ocean Renewable Power Company. We received one pot of funds through Department of Energy Office of Water Power Technology. And then secondly, in 2020, we were awarded the Indian Energy Grant, which would bring along the microgrid. So we have we have gone from, from an emerging technology point of view to, uh, actually, could you go back? Um, emerging technology to, to actually proving it. And it has required receiving as a tribal entity, the first federally um, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission license to do this. It's taken an incredible project team. We don't have the time or resources to share, but there's a YouTube video on link on the bottom of this that really gives you an overview of how this, this next portion that 
Uh, Carl will talk about how, you know, what it actually looks like through video footage. But our award with, with Indian Energy, um, the period of performance will end around March 2023. And it's about $3 million with a 50% cost share match. And we're, we're looking at potentially being diesels off and being ready for that phase uh, about two years ahead of schedule. So it's been an exciting project to be a part of, and I'll let, I'll turn it over to Carl in the next slide and then pick it up at the end. Thank you, Alexana. Um, I'm Carl Hill, I'm the village administrator and the village council vice president currently. Uh, good to hear Brian on. He has uh, a lot of familiarity with this project from the, um, Lake and Penn Borough side. Uh, as this slide says, we've come a long way and that's kind of uh, literally and figuratively. Um, it's been a long planning process. A lot of studies went into it until we had our first deployments in 2014. Um, figuratively and then um, literally, we have to make sure that anything that we have that's large, um, that needs to be transported to Igiagic has to fit on uh, 40 foot trailers at maximum because we come over from the Cook Inlet side, a barge goes into Williamsport, we offload onto trucks, they go over a 13 mile portage road, they get put on another barge and then barge another 90 miles down to Igiagic. And this can only happen um, around four or five months a year and within those four or five months you only have about four or five days where the tides are high enough to get into Williamsport. So we're, it's extremely logistically um, challenging to get heavy equipment and things here, much like a lot of other islanded communities in, in Alaska. Um, I heard a lot of similarities um, and same issues that um, we think about from the other presentations and um, really interesting to, to hear those. So th this is um, the RivGen that we currently have employed in modules being shipped over to Igiagic on barges. Um, and then in the upper right, you'll see assembly of the of the RivGen system on the beach in Igiagic with some of the heavy equipment we have available there. Uh, the lower right is the anchoring device that's used to moor the RivGen in place, and that's being deployed from our modular barge. And you can go to the next slide, please. So this is kind of an overall view of the project site. Um, this is the main part of our, we call this the old part of the village. Uh, there's a further expansion out further past the runway, but the project site is just downriver from Igiagic. And as Alex said, this is um, a pretty, uh, pretty unique location in that it has a steady flow of water, not much debris coming down. And so it's a great place to, kind of an ideal place to test the mechanics um, of, a, of a hydrokinetic device um, without having to worry about debris and, and uh, sediment transport to clog it up. Um, but yeah, we're a small community, about 65 to 70 folks. We had a lot of local involvement and a lot of expertise from uh, locals on deployment of this device and retrieval. You can see in the lower, lower left of this is a work boat that we use for um, raising and lowering the device and then a safety skip with a couple of the the local younger folks on there um, helping out and then lower right hand side is the deployment of the rib gen it's pushed into the um, lake right at the mouth of the river and then pushed um, down river to its mooring location by a converted 32 foot gill netter which you'll see in the center lower portion of the larger photo. Uh, next slide, please. So um, kind of as, as Sunny was describing, uh, a super important part of this is the microgrid system. We can have all of our solar, wind, and um, hydrokinetic device inputs, but if we don't have the right smart microgrid system installed, we won't be able to shut our diesels off when we're making enough power to uh, to run the community. We also have as part of as part of um, this DOE Indian Energy Grant is the energy storage portion of this, where we'll be able to charge the battery battery powers or batteries to power the community, and all the inputs will go into that smart microgrid, telling things 
you know, when the batteries are charged, when the diesels need to power up. Um, and the diesels will still remain the heart of our system because we know how to operate the diesels. We know the costs involved. We know how to keep them running. We do have local expertise now on deploying and retrieving and inspecting the devices. Uh, but to do the technical portions of it, we don't have the capacity. Um, so the microgrid is really key to this whole, to the whole overall picture of alternatives for our village. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to mention was we do have a, a waste heat system that powers our, our holding tank for our potable water and some of the other buildings. And so, um, you know, as, as Dan had mentioned, we're looking at other ways to, you know, if we're doing renewables and the diesels aren't running, we'll probably have to have electric boilers and things like that to, to do what we were using the waste heat from the diesels to do previously. Um, next uh, slide, please. So, um, as I was saying, we don't have the local capacity or technical expertise to to kind of sort through how these how these microgrids work and how they get installed. But we do have a really good team of folks working on it. Uh, they can they can kind of dumb it down for us a little bit and uh, kind of tell us how these work logically uh, without us getting too far into the weeds on it. But um, as most of you probably know, it's extremely complex, and so. We need to, uh, you know, as far as making decisions, we need to be educated enough to be able to make the decisions on this, but we will rely on our um, expertise, our technical expertise to make, make this stuff happen. Um, we have, we are taking advantage also of the technical assistance um, from the Department of Energy, Indian Energy Department. Um, I believe we're si signing up Alan Verbitsky to chime in on some of our technical issues. So that's going to be a huge help to us as well. Next slide, please. So with all the technical experts and um, tasks that need to be accomplished to integrate these microgrids, we ended up coming up with this matrix of, of um, roles and responsibilities for each, each component or each programming component for um, each of our um, areas of expertise. And we'll, we'll continue to do this. This one we have, um, currently is specifically for the microgrid and we intend to have um, uh, technical reviews of what we're doing every couple of weeks to include all of our technical assistance team that uh, that will kind of keep things um, coordinated one of the things that we worried about was having overlap from a bunch of different contractors driving costs up so in order if we lay this all out ahead of time document the roles and responsibilities we expect to be a little bit more have a little bit more cost effective effort that way uh, next slide please okay i will turn it back over to alexana to uh provide with some concluding thoughts well we're doing pretty good on time looks like we're at about 15 minutes so uh, thank you carl i wanted to joke about the roles and responsibilities matrix that it's been nice to report to different two different DOE departments and get feedback. It's been very, very helpful. At one of our meetings, I think Lizana said you should have an operations and maintenance column on this on this matrix. So we're we're incorporating that. But I was joking to her, you know, I thought my phone was so smart that it would just call the right agency when we had a problem. It would have it all sorted out because it's been <laughs> there are a lot of moving parts to it and we were concerned that each department wasn't talking to each other um, also just the ability to get the technical assistance has been really helpful i was thinking we were a little unclear um, with our two different awards the first award that we received from department of energy office of water and power technologies was focused on understanding ice and in particular frazzle ice and then to dealing with the smolt out migration which we're still proving uh, that no fish will be harmed with this device to date no fish have been harmed but that first entire award was to settle those two components of this RivGen power that our community needed to feel comfortable with in order to want to own the device which would then shape the next part that we're working on which is the opportunity for business ventures we have met and talked about options for ownership 
or what we're going to do but we decided recently that let's just wait until we've proven the small thought migration let's you know there are different points that we revisit this the indian energy grant has been specifically for the battery energy storage system and this very important microgrid and what I really have appreciated is the microgrid part has come with um, conversations with different types of alternative energy, like the wind power people who are working here and the hydro, so that we would eventually have a system that could integrate a diverse, and we could diversify our energy portfolio. Carl already mentioned the diesels are here to, here to stay. There is no room today to talk about the different state policies and programs and permitting that we're, that we're working with. Um, and we didn't talk much about COVID, but COVID was really key in our own staff getting real ex experience and expertise in deploying the device, like he mentioned, having to do it with a with a completely Alaska crew, which also goes back to the strength of this whole system, which was designed with the equipment we have locally available in mind. And I think that was my favorite part of everybody's presentation, looking at Togiak, that village picture could be Igiagig, and then thinking about each village considerations that of Nana's project and how they're tailored to the community. Uh, that's really our strength in that when situations like COVID come up, well, this was designed for with our equipment in mind. So we were able to do it with our own with our own crews. And unless Carl wants to add anything more, we could go to our final slide, which has our contact information. And yeah, I just wanted to, I did want to add something, Alex, sorry to tuck over you there. We've been practicing talking over each other with all of our presentations. Um, um, yeah, I did want to add that. So the end goal here, or our current end goal is once we have um, the microgrid um, installation figured out, we will also be building the second um, RIV gen. So we will end up with two RIV gens, one from the um, Department of Water Power for from, in, from the uh, Office of the DOE, and then also for uh, the second RIV gen would be from DOE Indian Energy. And so um, that ought to be enough to power our whole community. And we are still working on other renewables and Brian will probably be tapping you on the shoulder for solar one day in the near future. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> okay, anything else, Alexandra and Carl? No, we were at 19 minutes, so I think we did our best to fit it into 20 minutes and honor everyone's time, but this has been a great to get to know the other Alaskan panelists. Great. Um, and thank you. Thank you all. Um, again, I want to, you know, thank Sonny and Brian and Terrell and Dan, of course, and Alexander and Carl. It's, it's so cool to see these projects, you know, come to fruition. Um, anyway, it just just reminds us reminds me why why we're sort of here to help although you all do the hard work but uh, we love to see it so thank you again um, and Jane did you want to jump in and see if we have any questions yeah 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 I almost um, forgot thank about you, that part. <laughs> <laughs> no problem we do have a few questions so I'll I'll, I'll jump into them now. Um, first off, uh, to our audience and our presenters, uh, apologize for the sometimes delay in the slides. Uh, it's just the, the nature of the beast these days, it seems like, but uh, thanks for the patience there. We're, uh, we're doing the best we can on the slide advancing. <laughs> um, a question here uh, for, I can't rem remember if it was Kotzebue or Buckland, but uh, where, where the Connex was buried, did you need any additional seismic anchoring uh, for, for those foundations? So this is Trell. Uh, I can answer that. And I don't know if you want to hop in, Brian, but there was no seismic anchoring for Buckland or Deering that I remember because the way that they were engineered was for high winds. Uh, speaking anecdotally, being from uh, the village of Deering, it's not a very seismically active area. A lot more often when the houses shook, it was due to really high winds. So that's what we engineered it for. Okay, I, would add, 
I would add a little bit of a story. Uh, this is Brian in Buckland. Um, one of the connexes we buried and we tried to pull it out because it wasn't properly positioned. And there was so much uh, friction and suction from the ground, from the mud, that we literally could not pull the connex out. And because the village had so many connexes, we ended up having to smash it and put another one on top of it. So um, you know, we were pretty confident that um, the seismic issue wasn't going to be a big deal. And as Terrell said, I don't think there's a lot of seismic activity right there. But um, yeah, we once it was buried, we couldn't even get it out if we wanted to. Oh, wow. OK, thanks. Um, yeah, and I guess, in, you know, after I asked that question, I kind of realized the I would guess the solar array isn't, I mean, relatively speaking, it's not a very heavy load. Um, and I guess I was thinking I have a, a biomass project in Ambler that's going on uh, where it, it is also in connexes and we are going to be uh, seismically anchoring that. But I guess a handful of solar panels is a lot lighter than a giant water tank. Um, so anyway, anyway, thank you. Thanks. Um, another question here on the on the Kotzebue solar array. Uh, was that a single axis tracking project? And uh, related question, are you noticing any shading from the, the wind turbines? It is stationary. There's no uh, axis tracking single or dual. And um, there is a little bit of shading depending on where the sun is at that moment in the sky. And it was really a matter of cost and trade off. And given the other existing infrastructure that was already there, it seemed worth a, a marginal amount of lost solar output relative to the additional costs of um, having to reproduce what was already there. Great. Thanks, Brian. For the Togia Heat Loop project, um, talking about expanding it to, to, to various other loads, uh, is there a uh, maximum distance with which you can economically uh, deliver the, the waste heat from the source? Yeah, so in general, um, a, a general rule of thumb that we try to use at a and THC when we're working on these systems is you want to be within about a thousand feet of your heat source and that, that's just on the supply side uh, so the maximum distance would be a 2000 foot round trip um, and i think the the current plan in togiak the clinic uh, would be the last stop on the heat loop um, i think that's what the community intends and that is a little bit over the 2000 uh, foot mark um, you know if you trace the you know the water lines um and uh, you know we'll have to see what you know how it works out for them um togiak did recently get intertied to uh, a, another small village nearby twin hills um so that's actually increasing the amount of power they have to generate um and thus increasing the amount of heat available um and so that that allows them to go a little bit over the the 2000 foot mark uh, right, right. But yeah, if it's in a th within a thousand feet of the heat source, um, that's that's probably the cutoff. Great, thanks, Dan. Question for the Igiagic Hydrokinetic Project: um, Can can you describe a little bit the deployment and retrieval process for the for the unit and the role of the safety skiff? Sure, I can do that. Um, this is Carl. We we when we deploy it, um, what we found to work best is what we're describing as the side pivot deployment. So we'll pull up with a medium-sized vessel with a uh, with an air compressor on it, and to deploy it, we'll basically pump pump the air out of each pontoon, starting with the star or the port side. And so as we're pumping the air out, it's drawing water in through a one-way valve. It ballasts that down, and then we move over. We switch over the manifold to pump the air out of the starboard one, and so so then that ballasts it and to to the bottom. Um, we have had some frazzle ice occurrences that have raised the device to the surface, but so far it's uh, shed the ice and gone back down and and went back into operation. 
Um, retrieval is is basically the reverse of that. So we pump the pump air into one side and the water comes out and we float one side first and then move to the other pontoon and float it there. The safety skiff, um, anytime we have on water operations, we have the safety skiff with two people in it, basically hovering behind our work area in case someone um, falls overboard or falls off of the device, they can they can scoop them up and uh, bring them to safety. Also, I'll jump in, not only that, but all of the Bristol Bay boats go through and return after the commercial fishing season. And so we have had a little trouble with them traversing by while we're doing a maintenance event. And so the safety skiff is also responsible. We do our best to post everywhere to let every mariner know there are buoys, there are lights on it, but the safety skiff is a physical presence while there's being there's work being done. And we also didn't make it very clear in our presentation that that this rivgen connects directly to a submarine cable that connects to a transformer on shore that this this power is feeding right into our buried line distribution grid. Thanks, Carol and Alexana. Um, another question here for the two of you. Um, can you speak at all about the, the battery and the microgrid controllers? Um, what, like the specifics of it, what 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 chemistry or brand of battery and and uh, anything more about the controller? I guess you could pro you're probably better at taking that one than I, Alex. But um, we're going through Schneider, I believe it is, for our our uh, generator controls. Um, the batteries, I don't recall, Alex. It might be um, you might have a better idea. I don't don't recall. But um, as far as specifics for that goes, the idea is um, you know the batteries will stay charged as much as possible through renewables. If the renewables falter at some point and can't keep the batteries charged the um the the programming will allow the generators to or at least one generator appropriately sized to uh come online and operate at its greatest efficiency so right around 85 percent i believe is the number and it'll operate at that efficiency until the batteries are charged again um alex you might have some better ideas on the battery branding and whatnot no, actually, I don't. Uh, lately, we've been talking about the the microgrid portion, the battery energy storage system we ordered in October. These are really long technical proposals. I honestly don't remember, but another part we just recently had to figure out was the upgrade of the software for EasyGen. So we have three different three different things going on. Igiagig Village directly ordered the battery energy storage system. We were involved but didn't sign the purchase order for the microgrid part. We also executed a separate grant recently with Alaska Energy Authority and they haven't selected their contractor yet. So we have a lot of moving parts. We're also a little delayed. Uh, we're a little delayed. So it's this will all be installed by June, 2021. We're still working out the details and there I don't have any of the names or brands memorized I apologize it's no problem no problem at all we certainly don't mean to put you on the spot with those specifics but um we have one last question here and this is uh, back to the Kotzebue solar project um can the solar panels be angled to to get the higher gain in the winter due to sun reflecting off the snow so are, are you keeping them fixed or are you changing them with the season Sonny, do you want to answer that or? Yeah, they're, they're fixed. The, the, the neat thing about the Kotzebue project is there, those solar panels are bifacial. So I know Matt is really excited about, you know, their, what their performance are, is going to be in March and April. Uh, yeah, but they are stationary. You want to add anything to that, Brian? Yeah, I would just say for folks uh, not clear on bifacial, I mean, they, so they can produce solar uh, power from both sides. So while they're not moving, um, reflectance from the snow bouncing up to the back of the panels um, will be producing energy. And so uh, that's kind of a, a bit of a new technology that is out there. And I think it's the first one really on any commercial scale in Alaska 
And so we're excited to see how they perform and see they don't cost much more at all. And um, there should be, we're hoping for something like 10% increase in performance. So if it's a 2% cost and a 10% uh, bump in production, that's obviously a good deal. So we'll see what happens. Okay, thank you. That's 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 interesting. The the bifacial in, in the in the Alaska environment for sure, with the frequent occurrence of snow on the ground. All right, so that's our last question for the day. I'll pass it back to Lozana to, to wrap us up. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you, James. Um, thank you again to to the presenters um, for this session and for all the presenters uh, we had today. That sort of concludes uh, day two of the program review. Uh, virtual program review. Um, but if you are attending um, tomorrow's session, you will need to join using that registration link and call in number. Um, and we will be starting um, tomorrow at 1130. So I hope to see you guys back. And, and again, you know, thank you. Thank you, Sonny, Brian, Terrell, and Alexander and Carl, and to all our presenters. And thank you all for listening and joining in. Take care. Goodbye. Thanks. Have a good day. Thank you. Take care. Take care.